Hello members. My talk is going to be on mixing greens. First, I'll ask two basic questions. Why mix and why greens? I'm sure you're all aware that we have on the colour circle three primary colours, red, yellow and blue. They're the colours that can't be mixed from any other colours. Following that, however, we have secondary colours, which also I'm sure you're aware of, green, orange and violet. Each of those is made from mixing two of the primary colours. In the case of green, as you surely know, it's blue and yellow. OK, so green is basically a colour that mostly arises from mixing. Well, OK, there's three primary, three secondary colours produced by mixing. Why choose green? Green is by far, I think, the most popularly used of the secondary colours because naturally it's the dominant colour in landscape and landscape is possibly the most popular subject that any of us do. Other subjects of painting, such as portrait and still life, perhaps rely less on colour than drawing, but landscape uh, says so much about colour. So that's why mix my greens, but okay, we're mixing greens, but do we have to do it? Because you surely could buy greens that are already mixed, make the whole subject easier. Let me say, uh, in the last 55 years when I've been painting, I've hardly ever bought a ready mixed green. I've always used blue and yellow in a mixture. I might have some greens, they've probably been acquired as part of a set. So um, let's look at the greens that are ready made. I'm going to choose two first of all that might occur in sets. Uh, you find that um, different colours are provided and um, I hardly ever use green so I like many people will have a set that's got lots of blues and yellows that, that wear down because we've used them a lot but the green stays almost untouched. Okay here we've got first one Viridian is a very strong slightly bluey green. The other one Hooker's Green, believe, not surprisingly, discovered by a man called Hooker. Neither of these, to me, have sufficient natural quality if we're talking about landscape. A little bit sharp and fierce. Viridian, particularly. I might use it for a green front door or a, a wine bottle or something like that. But um, for natural colours, I think they're, they're lacking. They're slightly strong and artificial greens. So you might say, well, what can we use them for? Should we have them at all? Um, so I thought I'd go off on a tangent here and not just mix these greens, but see what we can do if we mix them with something else. Right. On this sheet, then, I have um, mixed greens, these two greens, with what is in fact the, the opposing colour on the colour circle, which is red. So if two opposing colours are mixed together, it tends to neutralise each of them. And you can see here, we've got the um, Viridian with uh, alizarin crimson. That's one of the common reds that we use. Viridian and cadmium red. Hooker's green with alizarin crimson and hooker's green with cadmium red. Um, they've come a very long way from the original colours and they're quite interesting, particularly I think the uh, Viridian and Elizabeth and Crimson have got a nice greeny grey there so uh, we could keep those in reserve and if you feel you know why have I got this Viridian I'm ever going to use it give it a try with with reds and see what we come up with. The third green I'd like to talk about that is available in ready-made form is sap green. I've got a sheet here at the top we've got sap green I think you'll agree it's much closer to what we'd require as a natural green for landscape painting. And here I've shown it in three tones. You could possibly do a landscape entirely in sap green, just using light and dark tones. But where the limitation will be, of course, is if we encountered a more bluey green in a tree or plant, or a more yellowy green. And inevitably, what we'd have to do is to mix blue and yellow with the sap green. I'm shortly going to talk about specific blues and yellows and what happens when we mix them together. 
but in this case I've put forward ultramarine and cobalt blue as the blues that we're probably going to encounter most often and the lemon yellow and cadmium yellow similarly for to represent yellows. You can see what happens when we mix each of the blues with the sap green. We've got ultramarine with the sap green, cobalt blue with it and lemon yellow and cadmium yellow. All these mixtures I think are perfectly feasible to use in a landscape but in a way it's getting more complicated because you've got the green and the blues and yellows and uh, I would actually find it easier and do find it easier just to be using blue and yellow only and probably gives us a more immediate variety of the greens we want to use. Now I'm talking about mixing all the time, mixing blue and yellows, this is obviously the way things are leading. Um, I must insist, must uh, stress that it only applies to paint. Watercolour is what I'm using for this demonstration, also there's acrylic and gouache. But um, I'm not suggesting in any way that we use blue and yellow in a mixture with pastel because that's just too much to take on. Um, if you're doing pastel you apply the colours directly and you do need uh, very appropriate greens in your box of pastels. You can apply a green and then adjust it slightly but uh, we, we've got to have the right greens uh, for pastel for landscape. So we've reached the point where we're going to talk about the blue and, blues and yellows uh, and dispense with the ready-made greens, put those behind us. I've got a sheet here then of the blues and yellows that I'm going to use as examples two of the blues I've mentioned already and two of the yellows. Okay, on the top line, firstly on the left there is the ultramarine, very commonly used blue, it's all over the place, everybody has one of these. Ultramarine is a cool blue, uh, therefore in making greens it will be used for the cooler greens, the more subdued greens, and it also has the characteristic of being quite a dark colour, so it's often used as the colour you use for shadows, particularly combined with something like brown where it's tending to go towards grey and the more paint you use it even can achieve something like a black. So that's ultramarine. Cobalt next is um, a warmer blue, mid-tone blue, it's the one I first reach for if I'm going to paint a sky and it's probably the one I use mostly with painting greens in nature and landscapes. Nice mid-blue and it can be combined with either of the yellows to create an effective green. Moving along, we've got intense blue. That's just a particular colour. It has, it comes in other names. This sort of sharp greeny blue. Um, I've, I've heard it calls Windsor blue and it's a little bit like Prussian blue as well, which is a kind of darker version of it. Um, it's fairly limited use for mixing with yellow in landscape. Uh, you probably, um, as we shall see later on, it would probably work with cadmium yellow, which is a little bit more warm and red, reddish, uh, but not so much with the lemon yellow. The cerulean is closer to the colour that we might recognise as turquoise, it's more greeny blue, and um, again, you probably wouldn't use it with lemon yellow, because that would just be a bit too much brightness, uh, but used with cadmium yellow, um, we, we could do something useful with it. So. Um, there's all these blues along the top, let's move to the yellows. Now again, um, like, cad like cobalt blue, uh, lemon yellow is probably the, uh, the main um, one that I reach for most of the time. Um, it can create quite a nice, um, rich, uh, fresh looking green, whereas cadmium yellow has the opposite role. Having that little bit of red in when it's combined with blue it's tending back towards the neutral, a slightly more browny green. So you have both these two, that it's really just these two yellows that I'm using nearly all the time, not reaching for any others, um, and uh, they, they can achieve the whole range of greens. And finally, I've put yellow ochre. Now, I put yellow because it, it yellow ochre in because it's got yellow in the name, but as you can see, it's, it's hardly a yellow in, in appearance. It's a sort of golden yellowy brown, but um, just because occasionally uh, you might want to combine it with some blues to create something which is on the borders of green and a sort of dull greyish colour, but um, that might come into nature. If it's not actually in the plants, it might be in something like a, a mossy wall or something like that. So 
Here we have the range of blues, and I think you can probably gather from what I've been saying that I'm in most of the painting, I'm going to limit myself to the two first blues and the two first yellows, with the occasional appearance of cerulean and yellow ochre. So now we'll have a look at what we get mixing together those four blues and those three yellows. So I prepare this chart and in the top corner here, these four are the results of combining the two blues, ultramarine and cobalt blue, and the two yellows, lemon yellow and cadmium yellow, which I'm suggesting really that is the most likely that we're going to use most of the time. So the ultramarine and lemon yellow, and then with cadmium yellow, you can see how it changes from fresher and brighter to slightly duller. Cobalt blue, lemon yellow, and with cadmium. So that's the sort of basic four mixtures. Across here, we've got what happens with intense blue and cerulean blue. And as I suggested when I was talking about the, the blues, um, they're probably too, too bright and not quite natural enough combined with lemon yellow. When we get them with cadmium, which has got an element of a slightly warmer yellow in it, it, it um, balances up against the blues to create something somewhat more natural. Though you might well think that these two mixtures could probably easily be achieved without basic blues and yellows. Along the bottom line, we've got to what happens when you combine each of them with yellow ochre, and that is a, a wide variety of um, colours that are just on the borders of green, uh, going towards grey and brown in some cases, um, hardly useful for uh, natural um, plants, trees, grass and so on, but quite likely to occur uh, in a landscape, perhaps uh, rocks, stones, walls, soil, uh, these sort of things. Yellow ochre is often a very, very useful base when combined with, with a blue and maybe a touch of brown. Stone walls, in fact, are, are just that combination. So looking at those mixtures, um, I've indicated that probably the pairing of ultramarine cobalt blue with the pairing of lemon yellow and cadmium yellow are what we'd use most of the time, possibly with occasional appearances of cerulean and yellow ochre. But of course, those mixtures I have tried to put in the same amount of the blue and yellow in each case. But of course, it's, it's no surprise is it, that those proportions can vary infinitely. And that's the job that we're going to have to do when we look at a green. We may initially decide which blue and which yellow it needs, but then a bit more of the yellow, a bit more of the blue is a question that we're always going to be asking. What I've prepared here is the sheet which shows the same mixtures, but it's varied this time. If there's more of the blue, more of the yellow. So ultramarine lemon yellow, we saw it a few minutes ago, but here more ultramarine going towards a bluey green, more lemon yellow towards a yellow, uh, more yellowy green. Here's ultramarine with cadmium. Again, more blue, more yellow. And similarly, cobalt now combined with the lemon and cobalt combined with the cadmium. So that's just a few examples, but in fact, there's a sliding scale with each of these mixtures. And uh, that's our job to do is to, uh, is to determine how much of each blue and each yellow. Well, the chart we looked at here, where I was showing how the green changes with more blue or more yellow, uh, another feature that you may well have noticed, because blue is a naturally darker color than yellow, in fact, there's hardly any color lighter than yellow, what happens if we add more blue, it also makes the colour darker. So I'd like to take us on to looking at how we produce shadows in the greens. So this next chart. I started with what might be a common mixture, the cobalt blue and lemon yellow, nice bright green, top of the plant, sun catching it. And we want to go a little bit darker. So what the first thing I do is keep to the lemon yellow, but change the blue. Um, changes the green very slightly, but that's going to happen if we're getting into the shadows. So it's made it darker, adding ultramarine. But what happens if you add more ultramarine, you are getting much more blue. And the plants don't necessarily get more blue just because they're in the shadow. 
So the one below is adding a new colour, which is the burnt umber, a brown, to the blue and yellow mix. It neutralises the blue, it stops it just getting bluer and bluer, and it also is making it darker. And the mixture at the bottom is the same thing as above, but um, it's a stronger mix, but I have put here, we're still keeping the yellow in, we're not dispensing with that, it's just not going just dead grey. Um, there's still just a slight hint of green about it. I've done these charts, of course, um, mainly for the purpose of demonstrating, uh, showing you the colours that um, are achievable, but um, I would recommend that you actually uh, might like to do something like this for yourself, to try out, get your blues and yellows, and uh, do a, an organised test of these colours. That may be just a one-off exercise, or there's no reason why you shouldn't keep it uh, long term and have it as a uh, colour reference when you're out in the landscape. Right, well this is uh, a scene rather familiar to me, it's the back garden behind my house. I've chosen this for obvious reasons, as you can see there's quite a wide variety of greens here, as well as the deep red, a few red flecks on the photinia. Let's have a look at uh, more detail then at uh, some of the plants that are here. The main feature is that eucalyptus tree and in terms of greens it's well to the end of the blue end of the spectrum. Almost more blue than green. Uh, other features more blue than green, there's one at the front here called the Euonymus and lurking behind at the eucalyptus, just in the shadows there, some of the darkest areas you can see uh, are a couple of conifers and we do find, don't we, with conifers that they can often tend very much towards the blue end of the green as well as being quite a vivid yellow, that one in front of the shed there is uh, a pretty yellowy green. So what I'm going to do here is um, sketch out the scene and then I think I'll sort of try and get, get some order out of the massive variety of greens and start laying in the the more blue areas and then perhaps go to the other end of the scale and lay the yellow areas in and then gradually work into the middle trying to get just a little bit of difference between different plants. You can see if you go through the middle there that um, the one below the eucalyptus is um, it's pretty strong yellowy green. On the right of it however is something that's um, perhaps going towards blue, a little bit greyish. So we'll see how we do. Okay, so here's the preliminary sketch. Uh, nothing too detailed, uh, not trying to show a relief, but I think it is quite helpful to show the general character of the texture of each shrub uh, by just showing the outline and the sort of leaves that they have on them. Uh, it's all in green apart from the obvious two red areas. That just gives me an idea. Uh, I don't think I'm in danger of getting lost, but uh, it seems a good idea just to do the red, the very red ones in a red crayon. Uh, compositionally, the eucalyptus is fairly central, but it's balanced perhaps on the left-hand corner, top left-hand corner, is actually looking into next door's garden where there's some colourful conifers. And then on the right, obviously, you've got the small section of the shed, which is sort of counteracts all the natural shapes. Um, the eucalyptus is going to occupy the top half, um, fairly constant colour and varying tones all over. And then in the bottom half, in the middle, is a whole collection of about eight fairly rounded shrubs that are of different colours. So we're going to have a go at that. So, just putting in a few dark tones to the eucalyptus now and we'll see what we've got. These are the main plants that are tending towards the blue. What I've done is started with eucalyptus. That was a mixture of actually two blues, cobalt and ceruleum because I mean cerulean is virtually a turquoise. I think that's where the colour of the eucalyptus is heading. 
those two then combine with a small amount of lemon yellow but as you can see the the blues are getting quite dominant to the left and right as i said before we've got these conifers just tucked away behind the eucalyptus up to the fence um, they're quite deep but again i've used cobalt blue not ultramarine uh, with lemon yellow still still keeping the overall effect fairly warm but turning very much towards the the blue using plenty of cobalt making it quite dark what i will do eventually is um, really paint into that with something much darker probably adding a brown to give us the deep shadows elsewhere we've got this euonymus at the front here which uh, we said looked fairly blue i've left a few patches there deliberately because it is actually a, a variegated plant so some of the lightness is because the leaves are almost cream color and right down here in the corner we have a plant called a pink or you might know it as a carnation and the leaves and stems of those are almost pale blue they're, they're hardly green at all right we've done quite a few of the mainly yellow shrubs this one has got some quite deep shadows so i'm just adding some of those with the same color but a bit darker right now looking at these we've got um one two three four five all of these i've simply done with a combination of lemon yellow and cobalt blue these two seem to be the favorites at the moment for all sorts of variations um these two in the middle are quite similar but uh, progressively this will have more shadow down below and this will remain lighter on top a lot of these will acquire more three-dimensional form uh, when shadows are added um, this one over here is again um, a variegated plant so i've left a few little white patches as is the case particularly with this one up the top corner here which um, is called a Wygelia for anybody that's interested. And although it appears uh, a light greenish yellow from a distance, in fact, every leaf is flecked. So that's the overall effect of it. So there is a collection of five more, gradually filling in the spaces. Let's see where we go next. Um, these are all fairly close already in color. And so I've got to sort of um, see if any of these uh, are still within this range or are they going more towards the blue end or the yellow end or I may well bring something in about the texture which gives the overall colour. This one here is a very light plant tend towards the yellow and I'm going to leave the top almost without paint for the moment and perhaps fill in a very light wash of yellow. And it's it's variegated and this is probably the, the lightest surface of all in the whole lot so I'm just going to um, touch in here and there again like a little more it'll have more shadow as we go down down towards the bottom but i'm i'm sort of dabbing with the brush to try and acquire this variegated look this plant here uh, described it originally as slightly greyish green fairly light but um, not quite as strong on the yellow as the others what i've done here is changed over to use ultramarine still with lemon yellow so that gives a generally cooler green i've also used ultramarine to do this one um, difficult to tell the difference between these but i just felt it needed a, a certain amount more depth and Again, it's combined with yellow, lemon yellow, but in this case, obviously, the lemon yellow is quite dominant compared with the blue. Well, it's been a fair bit more infilling since uh, the last little session. What I'm doing here is um, there is actually a plant. This part of it is in my garden, but uh, this bit which is quite similar in colour is next door's garden and um, you might think it's the same I've actually put a little bit of cerulean in this now to 
just to um, make it a little bit more what, warmer. Uh, having said that, um, since I've just said it's two different plants, I think what we'll do is um, take this down a bit, a bit being more distant, so we're getting a bit of aerial perspective. It can always be done later. I think what I might do is just wash it out slightly. So I've put it on, wet it and dab it off. Yeah, so that's a little bit more faint in the distance there. And this bit of it is the plant that's in my garden against the fence. What I'm going to do is that area there, which again, if you remember from the scene, is quite a big conifer, dark here, uh, buried in against that one, but getting lighter towards the edge and distinctly in the yellow area. One thing I think I've got to bear in mind, however, is this is overall composition. It doesn't want to shout up in that corner. So I'll paint it um, not too uh, contrasty and it's in the distance. So keep it a little bit soft, I think. I just said I've um, introduced shadows here, setting it behind this one. Uh, what I've actually done here for the very first time, I've brought some cadmium yellow in with the ultramarine. So that, that should be a much duller dark green in there. As I've moved across, I put a little bit more lemon yellow in that's still keeping the cadmium. But as we come towards the edge here, I'm going to just go for lemon yellow and, and ultramarine mixture. Still ultramarine, so it uh, should keep the colour down a little bit, just looking at it because that that conifer very much grows sideways like this. So we're getting a progression of colour and I'm going to just um, blur it a little bit now so it doesn't uh, distract us too much from the centre. So getting that change of colour as it goes across and I'm as I get to the edge of a plant, I'm just working in to give the shape of the other one. That At a later stage, I'll do a bit more working in to define plants a little bit more. The, um, the shadowy parts are actually looking a bit pale now, so I'm going to come back in again. While it's still wet, but at, hopefully at a safe stage, so I'm not going to cause any uh, problems. Right, this is going in again with the First use of ultramarine and cadmium yellow. You should be able to see how it's somewhat deeper and duller than the other greens that we've used. Well, this is how the painting's going so far, but uh, just as a little break, we'll have a look behind the scenes, as it were. Um, each color I put on there is not just um, guesswork put straight on the painting. Um, as you may well do yourself, I try them out first. So let's have a look down at the laboratory area. All these test pads, test patches are done because uh, I was trying out just the right sort of colour. Make sure the mixture was right. Over here is the source of paint. These are the sketches blocks that I always use outside, but are quite convenient for using inside as well. And Obviously they're in blocks and when you've used a lot of one colour it develops holes in. Um, and uh, what I do is squeeze some paint out of a tube in there because tubes are a bit more of a nuisance to use when you're working instantly. This is my palette. There's a few colours in squeezed out of tubes. They'll usually be the ones that um, I actually haven't got in the blocks. Then I'm doing the lawn, um, lemon yellow, cobalt, but I thought this time I would add a bit of cerulean, make it slightly warmer, green, and I've done it wet and wet, so I'm just going to dab in a few slightly darker bits and let them sort of merge in. We are. So on the lawn are some brown patches. Well, that's because I thought we needed some reseeding after this very dry season that we've had, but um, we won't include those in the painting. 
So we'll let the greens run together on the lawn. There we are. So now it's onto the soil, which is not green. So I've got to find a suitable mixture in the sort of gray brown area. That's, there's these greens that we don't use, including hooker's green. And this is an occasion where we could make an interesting kind of grayish brown. And you can see that I'm putting the hooker's green in with the brown. This is a, a light wash here. I'm just going to put some in the, the shadow there. And you put it with a very opposing colour, which is the cadmium red. And uh, amazingly, we get a neutral, quite pleasant brown. And that could be a good shadow for underneath the various plants to give them a bit of depth and 3D presence. I'll just soften that off slightly. And uh, I've deliberately, I will add texture later, but I've deliberately dabbed on the soil. So it will look rough, but not too, um, too much as to distract our view. Well, I keep talking about this red area. I think it's time we shall delay no longer. Right, I've laid a wash down and I decided that a um, combination of the two reds, alizarin crimson and cadmium red, would get me somewhere near what I wanted. Just add it a little bit more. Doesn't want to be too dark because these are actually the light bits of the plant that are showing and I shall work in the shadows a bit later. Um, so I'll put alizarin crimson, cadmium red and actually just a slight touch of ultramarine to just give a hint of purple. So I've left gaps. Um, I could actually do it all over, I suppose, because they're going to be shadows, but um, I think it's quite helpful to keep the texture going rather than do it plain and try and bring it back later. So that's coming on. So that's the big red area. Down on the left there will be quite a bit darker ultramarine and here's something new crimson is the mixture i'm going to put some brown in this time it's progressively where we'll go with the shadows yeah we're going to go darker this will all be a shadowy area eventually but it does uh, disappear into shadow over here so you can see that we can't make the red darker by just putting more red because it will just be, well, more red. So often it's a brown or a blue or those two in combination. So that's going to be, and that darker colour will I'll eventually work it into all these shadows in more detail. The shed's gone in. Uh, I mentioned brown a minute ago. The brown concern was burnt umber, which is a fairly warm brown anyway. And uh, just to warm it up slightly, I've um, added some laser and crimson. What I've done, as you can see, is do a sort of negative painting round the edge of that light green plant that's coming up, and also the more yellowy one to the left, to the right. Um, I can tighten this up a little bit later, but it begins to give the feeling of the shape of the edge of the plant, which is best defined by painting something dark behind it. I'm on with the shed now, and once again, I've decided to uh, get the hooker's green to uh, work for its living. Right, it's fairly wet, so I'm going to do a bit of a wet and wet to it there. You can see the touch of green, but uh, nothing like the strength of hookers as it would be on it, used on its own, which is a bit fierce. This is taken right down with the red, but what it is, it's a grey with a hint of green about it. That's the sort of slight bit of moss that gathers on the shed roof with the damp. So as planned, I've put in that area of dark green. It's a conifer, it's a big tall hedge. Uh, it's dark because it is dark and it's also in shadow and it's uh, giving, it should be projecting the eucalyptus forward. Uh, I've begun to tighten up the edge around the eucalyptus but not entirely covered. I'll leave it at that stage and then I will spend a bit of more detailed time uh, just tightening up the textures and deepening the shadows and see where we get to after that. So we're now starting the fill-in process and adding some shadows. The biggest area is the 
eucalyptus. I'm going to go into that. I really started before putting a few um, darker shapes in and uh, I'm going to add more. Now this colour is the same mix as before, which was um, cerulean blue, cobalt blue and a bit of lemon yellow. But it may not be noticeable, but just because we're going into the shadows here and it's a little bit darker, but also slightly less blue than the outside. I've just put a quick flick of the burnt umber in the brown. So there we are. Just going for areas that could be shadows when we've got these lighter bits of leaf standing out. This is just initial process. And I sketched in a few branches there and we'll just flick those in with some brown fairly soon. But we just want to get a balance of light and dark areas. So that's those going in. What I'm now going to do is re revert back to the mixture that we had for the leaves themselves and put a, a lighter mixture in, quite thin, quite watery. We're going to begin to bring out the areas that are actually going to be leaf areas. Just begin to sort of pick out the shapes of clumps of leaves. They are there on the sketch underneath, but um, I can barely see them. So we um, need to get a sort of contrast, lights and darks, covering the whole thing, a bit more there. So dabbing around, still keeping that colour till the whole surface is coloured in, painted in, in one tone or other of the eucalyptus colour, might be called. These little holes here, of course, were in left by painting the conifer in, and they should be occupied by eucalyptus leaves. So we'll get those in. Right, so it's beginning to look to have some density as a tree, but I've just been doing a little bit of work off camera now. Uh, I thought I would, I uh, couldn't resist the temptation just to go in a little bit with um, slightly more detail around the leaves. You can see that I've um, been to do this sort of thing. That's a bit too green, a bit more blue going into it. Just a quick little flick to suggest the odd leaf here and there, or patches of leaves. Just beware of trying to get into too much detail, it's just the overall effect that we want. So something like that, that's kind of completed the process for the moment. I thought I'd just show you what I'm up to. And um, as always, we don't want anything to shout out too much. I'm actually going to uh, soften some of those dabbing. and we'll apply the tissue. There we are. Right, what I'm going to do now is um, I'll have a little break and be getting on with this red area here. That's uh, Berberis thunbergi for the garden experts. Same process again as the eucalyptus, I think, is to um, seek out the dark areas that colour was um, the two reds, alizarin, crimson, cadmium red. And as with the eucalyptus, I'm expecting, well, as I did, in fact, with this area here, I'm going to put some more brown into it to deepen the shadows. So I do a little bit of work on that and you can see how far I've got next. That's quite a bit of work done there, about 10, 15 minutes on the Berberis. Lots of dark areas in, leaving light areas. 
Uh, you notice I've gone deeper down here where it is in shadow. Uh, I'll let that dry and probably go over it again to create a darker tone. But as you can probably tell, more brown has come in there, even a touch of the ultramarine. So let's do the same thing again as I did with the eucalyptus. We'll work into these light areas. Begin to, I mean, they're, they're pretty definite anyway, but I'll kind of, well, partly soften them up and partly just clear the way for where they're going to be because these are actual blobs of leaves on the stems so they begin to have a, a shape of their own. Uh, in terms of background relationships these are going to be lighter than this conifer which at some stage will need to be made quite a bit darker. So same again just a sort of a soft brush partly pressed onto the surface just bringing these out and it's actually um, spreading the light red colour into those shapes but keeping it light so softening the distinction between the light and dark areas wet brush again no paint on it just making sure that it's all gone this pink sort of colour in that session there I went in actually into the darker areas and began to dab uh, and in a slightly bit more detail suggesting which is the fact that this berberis is quite a spiky plant with little little leaves and a few thorns and things um, that has worked i think in terms of the texture but we're now getting the contrast between the dark and light it's a little bit strong at the moment and it's dominating the picture obviously everything else will have its own strength as well so as so often with painting we've got um, constant interplay between sharpening and softening again so i'm going into these light areas just to take off a little bit of the sharpness and contrast but um, leaving the general character of the plant underneath oh can you see what's happened here uh, i just thought this is supposed to be mixing greens and i've been on reds for ages now and um as you can gather i'm not actually outside but i can easily go and look at the scene again and uh, i realized that the berberis has a few green leaves inside in fact if you decide to give it a haircut uh, it goes green all the reds on the outside so i think harmonizing with the rest of the picture i've dabbed in a few little green bits here which is um, cobalt blue and lemon yellow leave that for the moment one thing by the way i've done at the bottom here of course is quite a definite edge because that's providing an edge for these three plants here uh, with using the shadow behind I think having spoken about these conifers, so that obviously needs to be a bit darker, I think I might do those next. That's that one there and one the other side of the eucalyptus, which is somewhere here. As I had intended, these two conifers behind the eucalyptus got those in pretty dark. And progressively, we are defining the shapes of the plants in front of them negatively by painting the dark and allowing the light to form its own shape. Conifer this side is a little bit lighter and again I'm bordering this plant making that stand forward. Uh, I just realised uh, as I looked at it again there was a space here that wasn't painted and in fact it is um, some lower branches of the eucalyptus. This well I've been working on I think five plants since the last session. We had the two conifers in deep bluish and in the shadows done this plant here um, i think that was the one that had ultramarine but still with the lemon yellow it progressively gets darker as it goes behind the eucalyptus there this one is a very bold one right in front of the eucalyptus very yellow just touched a few shadows in a little bit of brown possibly coming in the shadows there but pre uh, predominantly yellow coming forward this is the box which is quite similar in color to that one uh, still running on um, cobalt blue with lemon yellow but introducing a bit more cobalt slightly bluish shadows i think around the front here this one i uh, believe it or not i have painted but keeping it um, very light it's uh, it's a pale plant anyway yellow leaves and white flecked and it's actually catching the light i think so that group there is is together oh this one as well um originally and again now is was done with uh, ultramarine 
specifically with the lemon yellow, not cobalt. And that, uh, that bluey grayness is coming out. So a central group there. Um, I think what I'll do next is just work down to this corner, get that completed. Okay, well, uh, I'm working down in this corner now. This plant here is one of those that's definitely towards the blue end. Um, I could go in with the shadows first, so I think I might do that. Get some dark areas established. Now, going back to the mixture of blues and yellows, I've got here cobalt and lemon, which should be quite a strong, vivid colour. But uh, obviously, as you can see clearly, it's veering very much towards the blue, so I've quite a lot more cobalt in than I have in lemon yellow. So we're uh, laying a few dark areas in and then just laying a bit more colour onto the rest. I think probably that'll be just the basic plan and I'll return to it when it's dried and just strengthen up those blue shadows. So that's another one in the blue category. Uh, I think while we're on with this sort of range of colour, down in the bottom corner is a plant called Pinks, because they have, guess what, pink flowers. And um, that is particularly blue, somewhat lighter than the one I've just done. So I'm going to mix up a similar wash, but make the whole thing lighter and as almost no shadows in it it's just a I just flick it because it grows in stems like this so keeping it light and very much on the blue so we had a couple there I'm just waiting for that to dry to add a few more shadows what I could do while I'm in this area of color uh, over here is that plant I mentioned before it's a euonymus and it's not only towards the blue end, perhaps not quite as blue as these two, a little bit more yellow going in there. But it's also one of these variegated plants. So the white areas that I've left before, I'm intending to keep leaving white and just start dabbing in with a bit more colour, but try and preserve those white areas because they're representing the flex on a variegated plant. So going in there and adding little bit of colour, dabbing in, preserving the white flex. And finally now I'll go back to the first one I did, mixing up um, something that's towards blue. I'm adding a little bit more cobalt here to the mix and we're going to add just a few shadows. Right, so we're going in here like this Still a bit wet, so it's spreading them slightly, but that's what we want. One plant I noticed that I've uh, hardly done anything on so far, which is rather standing out as the unfinished bit, is this one here. It's quite a complex plant. It's got uh, fairly green leaves in sort of middle range, um, little spots of yellow and you can hardly see on the photo but um, it's got little red berries and also quite shadowy. Um, what I'm going to do first I think is to get those shadows in to create some depth. So as I said before with shadows we're not going to just add more and more of the blue for instance to make it darker. We've got to bring in something like a brown to take off the strength of the colour. So here we are I'm going in here with the dark shadows. You can see it's uh, just got a slight touch of green because it's the ultramarine and some burnt umber to give it the brown but I did add, to add a touch of cadmium yellow so that it uh, it still stays a little bit green so here's the, the shadows of that one dabbing in there give it some depth I think I'll have another session darkening these a bit later on but uh, there we are we've got a shadowy area that's going to make the plant here stand out a bit by being lighter 
Also the one that I've just recently done, we can give that a bit of an edge as well. And this again is something very light, so all, all round on three sides we can get the contrast of the lighter plants. Right, next we've got to get some uh, basic middle green in, so I'm going back to my lemon yellow and I think the cobalt, give it some nice bright strength. So in go the, the greens here. And perhaps leave a few patches because there are some quite yellow bits. Right, so that's got that. That'll need to dry and deepen the shadows, strengthen the yellow a little bit, but uh, that's got it established. It's no longer looking uh, neglected and unfinished. I think while I'm in this session, I didn't do much on that before. I think we'll come back in with a little bit of yellow, a touch of cobalt. It's one of the yellowest plants of the whole lot, but uh, still looking a little bit unfinished. So I'm mixing up a, a bit of, there we are, a little bit more yellow on. Still the white flecks got to be kept unpainted but it just looks a little bit more full of color. I'll add a few yellow dabs over here. But that's um, got a bit more done to that one. So the things are gradually filling in. Right, I had a little uh, off camera session there just to move things on a little bit. Uh, the plant I've just done here with the shadows, I've darkened the shadows, uh, same mixture, blue, brown, little bit of yellow, brought out the strength of the yellowy green there, and that's looking a bit more solid. Um, touch more on this, even though it's staying a light plant, is uh, a few shadows down the bottom, separate it from this one. I've defined the shadows a little bit more than this, and then I've come over here and added some darker bits of shadows on there. Right, moving across, we've got these two looking unfinished. Uh, nothing particularly complicated about those. Uh, here we have a plant, it's called a potentilla, but uh, just about the middle green. So we'll just dab at it and add a little bit more texture. It grows up in fairly thin stems like this, and I will just pop in a couple of flowers, quite orangey actually. Oh, that's something new, isn't it? Orange. I think we're going to need to uh, visit the red for this purpose. Right, just a few stems coming up. Okay, let's have a bit of fun while we're on with it. I've uh, got a, a red here. Right, just a few little flex orange flowers. Just dabbed around like that. Okay, moving on uh, down here, another plant. Uh, compared with that, it's lighter green, maybe slightly towards the blue. So we constantly varying slight variations of blue and yellow. And this one is one that grows across rather like this. So that's needing a little bit more yellow in the mix. So let's just dab across like this. So the plants not only contrasting with each other by the colour, but the way I'm trying to paint them, it's showing the way that they tend to grow. So that again distinguishes one from another. I've just done a little bit of work off camera to move things along a bit, plants that aren't particularly significant. Um, there's one here at the front, it's called the Rock Rose, mid-green, uh, slightly darkening towards the lawn. Uh, this darker one here, it's a fuchsia, uh, mid-green again, but darker because it's uh, in shadow, hiding behind the others. Another Euonymus here, 
kept the flex in and also discovered there's another pink here so those are sort of fill-in plants and uh, I've um, saved a bit of time by uh, getting on with them what I'm going to do now however is this one here this is this is the biggest obvious gap that's left and it's one of the more yellowy plants in the whole place so let's get in with um, quite a yellow mix here yeah that's uh, about where I want to be I think um, might just put this on and then lighten it very slightly because the thing is catching the light but I think in terms of color we're about right this is once again lemon yellow cobalt blue for the strongest mixture right, what I've done there is actually put the light lightest bits in uh, to give me an idea of where I want to stay with the tone um, and we'll dab that and then I will go in with a more greeny mixture which we're getting in the in the darker bits not too dark though that that's going to be a little bit too dark more with the yellow right so let's uh, now I could still do with a little bit more yellow I don't want to be too contrasty there we are so we're working between the lighter yellows lighter yellowy greens I should say with the shadows so we've got contrast of two variations in the color and down the bottom here, as with them all, a bit of shadow underneath, so it's dark as we go down to there. The green on here. Right, so that certainly filled that in pretty well. A bit more shadow down here. Uh, next job, moving upwards, this is the Photinia. And uh, it's a rich, deep green quite a lot of shadow because it's uh, it's overhanging there's a gap underneath there and as I mentioned quite some time ago now it's the one plant that's got some red flecks on uh, I've left some white gaps I'm going to continue to leave those so that we can lay the green in um, I think on this occasion I'm going to just get established with the, the green that I want for most of the plants most of the uh, leaves rather um, somewhere around here yeah I think a bit darker than the original sketch um, I think I'll do most of it and then in this case lay the shadows over the top rather than leaving a space for them so here we are with quite a rich green coming round again thinking of how it grows in fairly large leaves so I'm doming these on to suggest leaves and moving up to the top, uh, I'm looking at the areas that I'm going to put some red flecks in. So I'm going to leave some spaces, a little bit more mix. And uh, same mix, same yellow, same blue, but in different proportions. I'll come down here. This is going to be shadow, but we might as well just lay some green on to start with. So we're up to about here with the... Fotinia, fill the whole space of it. There's a white gap here. I think that's going to be sort of divided between the Fotinia and the plant behind it. Right, so working up to here, leaving more areas for the red. So that's the green established. Let's get some shadow in. And once again, uh, ah, I'm going to check, as I often do for shadows, I'm going to change over to using ultramarine as the blue to uh, dial down the strength of the blue. And I'm adding lemon yellow and, as I sometimes do with shadows, adding a little bit of cadmium yellow, which uh, dulls the, the green down a bit further. So that's ultramarine, lemon yellow and cadmium one blue two yellows and then a flick of burnt amber going in 
see how we get on with the shadow. Yeah, bit more burnt umber, bit more ultramarine. And uh, yeah, that should be about in the right area. Here's another chance where we can uh, define the plant next to it by doing a bit of an edge. And uh, yeah, even the, the fuchsia is in front of it. So I'm doing that edge quite dark there and letting it just creep up into the leaves. It's also dark over here. But then it does stand out lighter than the conifer behind it. So we get all these tonal relationships. Right, comes right down here, still the shadow. And we'll just let that shadow pop up here and there into the plant higher up. Okay, that's about where it is, I think. Right, shall we flick that red on then? Um, red, well, as so often, it's going to be a mixture of crimson and cadmium red. Okay, so uh, you actually get stems, red stems like this, and then leaves begin to form on top of them. That's what a photinia does when you cut it down. It was green and then over the weeks, red bits start to appear. So we've got those in there. Okay, moving on towards the end. Um, quick little bits of uh, off camera work. This one's looking a bit light, not much paint on it. Uh, just dabbed on with a green mixture veering slightly towards the blue. This was a patch which is actually next door's garden. It was just a light patch and because it was so plain it was standing out. I've just dabbed a little bit of texture on it and then following that I've just emphasised the edge of the eucalyptus a little bit to try and bring it forward. Right, next job that I mentioned is uh, possibly getting towards the end here is just doing something else with the soil and uh, you'll notice that the, the edge of the lawn looks rather scruffy, so we'll uh, tidy that up. Uh, what I'm going to do is just use a flat brush here to pull out a line um, closer to my original drawn line. So this is like trimming the edge of the grass, keeping your garden looking neat. So we'll pull out a line there with a flat brush. There we go. Right, now uh, the mixture, remember, before for the soil was unusually the Viridian green, sitting there looking hardly used at all, and a red, in this case the cadmium red. So here's the mixture being mixed up. But um, what I haven't quite got enough of in the painting is the variation in tone, because obviously we've got a lot of shadows. So let's just work through. Um, there's a definite shadow here. I'll mix, make a quite a strong mixture of the two there and um, go underneath the plants. So this is gonna have the effect of making them stand out and give it the shadow. So as we said, the rather strong and vivid green mixed with the cadmium red gives us something like a, a deep brown which can be useful. Uh, using this now to define the top of this plant. It's an area of shadow going in. Comes around here a little bit. More shadow over here. But we just recently did a light plant there. The shadow doesn't come very far so I'm going to just take it to there. So there's some areas going in, um, shadow here creeping between those two, extending the shadow on that plant, a um, bit under here. There's a patch there I haven't done anything with, I don't know why, perhaps fill that in later. So those are probably the main shadows, no there's one just here under that one, 
Need to get the mixture strengthened up a bit. Iridium, cadmium red, making something of a brown. Okay, shadow goes under here. Extends forward a little bit. Right, so those are the main areas of shadow. Darken that one slightly. Okay, oh, um, yeah, there's a tiny bit under there, not much. And tiny bit here. Right, we're probably about there, along the edge of this, yes. So what I'm going to do now, got them in, but it does get a lot lighter once it's out of the shadows. Sorry, I'm not quite getting that into the soil there. So next job is to soften the edge of each of these because it gets lighter fairly quickly. So just take the definite edge off. And I think, in fact, the rest of the soil now look is looking a little bit dark. The photo was taken in sunlight and the soil looks pretty light. So I'm going to just uh, wash around a little bit and uh, wet it, begin to dissolve the original paint and dab on with the tissue just to lighten it slightly. This area here as well, just lightening a bit and dab on. This area needs softening in. Finally, because it's soil, I haven't quite got uh, texture. So I'll just do one final round of um, just sort of dabbing the brush at it to suggest the irregularities in the soil, maybe little clumps, stones and things like this. So that's going to give it the uh, effect of being something other than just a smooth surface. Hello members. Well, I hope you found my demonstration, virtual demonstration, informative and interesting. And uh, I hope my painting skills are somewhat better than my filming skills, though I'm sure that Joe will have done a great job polishing up my initial effort to make something that's in a watchable state. Now, I used an outdoor scene, that's my back garden, and I also did a compositional sketch while I was sitting out there. But as you're aware, uh, the painting was done here in my art room. I felt that was better. I could concentrate on explaining each stage that I was working at in detail. Uh, and I was free of extraneous noise, like the wind blowing. And also uh, I was able to position the uh, camera or the phone, the phone camera in the best position. So that's why I painted inside from an outside scene. And I think that's quite a good practice. Well, I hope that uh, what you've seen has inspired you to paint something similar. If you choose a scene that is familiar to you, it could be your garden or a local park. Um, try and do a sketch, but if that's not possible, take a photo, but a, a recent one, and have a look at the plants in detail before you just take the photo and walk away. And if it is something like your garden, of course, you can be starting the painting, break off for five or 10 minutes, go and have a look at it again to refresh your memory of different greens. So I shall be really looking forward to seeing the results of what you've done. And I hope I shall feel, I'm sure I will, that it's been worth my efforts to make this video explaining about mixing greens. Thank you.